my name is Douglas Carter Bean, aging wunderkind. Uh, I've written a couple of musicals, and none of them have really made me any money. So I have come to the home of Thomas Meehan. Thomas Meehan is the most successful book writer of musicals. If you were in high school and you did a show, chances are you were speaking the words of Thomas Meehan. I'm gonna go meet Thomas, and I'm gonna grill him, find out the key to success, how to write, how to do exposition and make it fresh and exciting, and how to go into the numbers and make reprises fresh as daisies. Let's go meet Tom. Sorry, no peddlers. Hi, I'm Hi Douglas how are you? How are you? Hey, Douglas, so nice to meet you. It's great. We've never yeah. met. We've never met, and it's so nice of you to do this. What an amazing place. What a fun house it is. This is what my wife's doing. This place was a wreck when we bought it five years ago. But it's really great. Yeah. It's really great. Now, have you always lived in the village? Or? Yeah, we used to live on Jane Street, so we're, we're village type. Your village types. Village types. Did you wear a beret? The village people. <laughs> Did you wear a beret in the day? Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. I want to know where you work. You'd like stretch out here on a sofa like Sondheim? I've got a place downstairs for you, actually. Really? Are we allowed down there? So they can do well. The inner sanctum? Follow me downstairs, all right? If you should choose to celebrate Christmas, this would be a great house for Christmas. Oh, well, we do. There's a lot of Alphonse Mukta here, a lot of Maxfield Parish, which we love. Here is the homage to you. Oh, come on. How great is this? How about this? Look at that surprising amount of pornography. I can, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm able to hide away from everybody here. Uh, yeah, it is. It's a great, it's a really thick door. It's a thick door. It's quiet down here. I don't hear anything. And then I go to work promptly every day at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Excellent. The crack of one. <laughs> and I see there's a, a royal typewriter poster there. That's from my that days look? of typing. Yeah. Uh, I typed Annie on a royal typewriter. I think I'm and just, I, I just learned to type it. Like the end of typewriters when I was just starting. Yeah. Took a lot of force, didn't it? Oh, it did. I mean, you could wear yourself out and you're back in the, a few hours of the typewriter. And you need to go to a spa. <laughs> yeah. My days of uh, writing that script were kind of lean days. I'd, I'd, Loves the New Yorker, was freelancing, and two little children, mm -hmm. and so with no money. Right. When Annie approached Broadway, I was surprised to be asked, what are you going to do after Annie opens? And I said, I'm either going to the Bahamas or I'm jumping off the George Washington Bridge, <laughs> because uh, that's where I was. Wow. Just on the edge of bankruptcy. So it was very nice to have a hit at that oh time. Oh, my God. And, do you, and then I think you're thinking about, of stuff. You're thinking of all, and you do. You have stuff in your head. You're walking around thinking of stuff. I do a lot of thinking before, and the 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 other thing is, I, if I just said that, decided that I'm going to do it, mm -hmm. then if it's a book or if it's a movie mm -hmm. or if it's a play, I immerse myself in that, and then I write an outline, mm -hmm. changing it into a musical as best I can, mm -hmm. with uh, dummy titled songs and. Mm -hmm what I wow, think each moment great. is all the way through the show. Oh, these, that's fantastic. These outlines are detailed. Uh, I just did one that's like 32 pages of... Uh, Might as well write the show, 32, know, pages. 32 pages. What percentage, I just saw the Sondheim on Sondheim show, and I was surprised and delighted that he just says he's never come up with an idea for a show. People have always come oh, to I him know, with yeah. ideas. Yeah, usually, people come with people you with ideas. People come to me, and, uh, and they come to me with some of the most cockamamie ideas you'll ever heard. Oh, please. Let me tell you. They go, after you pass, I get the call. <laughs> Whatever. But, <laughs> but uh, so, so if something seems like it's fun to me, uh, it's, there's no reason to spend a lot of time on something that right. can be arduous. Or... So Annie was your first musical? Yes. Right. And what did they approach you with? Did they, did, said, was it Martin Sharnan or Charles Strauss? It, or was, who? it was Martin Sharnan and... I was working at the New Yorker and got a call mm -hmm. from Martin Charnin. He said, "This, I can't say on the phone. It's too, it's too secret. You know, it's too, too good an idea." I, I went to his. He had an office up on uh, 57th Street, and I went to his office and sat down. And he said, "Here it is, Little Orphan Annie." And I said, "You've got to be kidding." So this ugh, you know. <laughs> so I want to do West Side Story. I want to do yeah, My Fair yeah. Lady. I want to uh -huh. do something serious. He said, well, all right, but 
I got, I, my friend Charles Strauss has said he's doing the music. I said, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> so Strauss already had two or three Tonys, and Martin, yeah. Martin had been in the original cast of West Side Story, mm -hmm. had done shows. Yeah. So I said, wait a second. Who am I to say no to these guys? Yeah. So I went to the uh, Daily News, to mm -hmm. the files, and, and Annie, uh, Little Orphan Annie, started in 1924. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I went through a microfilm of about 40 years of this stuff, and I came back and said, there's no story, but there is the richest man in the world, the poorest girl, and the dog. Yeah. Let, let me think, what, what can I do? So I said, we'll put it in New York, and how about the Depression? Mm -hmm. uh, because at the time Nixon was president, mm -hmm. let's do something about when America cared about, and had a caring government, Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And Annie was really a metaphor for that. Mm -hmm. She invents the New Deal and of course the mm -hmm. Charlotte. So, and the other thing is I was a great reader of Dickens, and uh, yeah. I said, I can cook up a Dickens plot here. Well, that's interesting because yeah. I remember when the show was out, the New Yorker, it was the New Yorker Review said, yeah. we love it, it's Oliver Twist and Drag. Yeah, right. <laughs> I consider that as a... Uh, Come stream compliment. Really compliment, because I think Oliver Twist is terrific. So the minute the locket came out, I was like, we're home, <laughs> right. we're home. Half the silver locket, yeah. And yeah. all that whole thing, and the, the villains are very Dickensian. Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Mudge. Oh, completely, yeah. yeah. All that stuff. Oh, I never, I never, that's really yeah, beautiful so, connection. So it was fun to write, and then, uh, but in 1972, we actually wrote the show. The, the first song that Charles played, played for me was Hard Knock Life. I said, mm -hmm. this is pretty good. Yeah. And then the next one was Tomorrow. Mm. I said, we're home. Yeah. But then every producer in New York turned it down. Uh, you need to say that sentence one more time, so because it's I just need every writer I know right. is thinking they're the failure of the world, right? And they all say like, "Oh, no one will do my play," and I just say West Side Story, and now I can say Annie. Annie, absolutely. Uh, Schubert said, "Little girl and dog, please." <laughs> no, who, who would want that? <laughs> Actually, the Schuberts have turned down every show. Uh, they said the producers are too inside, <laughs> and the hairspray they didn't like. So you know. <laughs> so I think if the Schubert's like it, we better, we better not do it. You'll leave the business. I'll, I'll leave the business because I know it'll be a fa fail. So I, I took all my anti stuff in a cardboard box and put it up in the attic, mm -hmm. and, and there it sat for four years. Wow. But uh, then Mike Nichols mm -hmm. came, came up to see it. And uh, at that time, he was the, the biggest name in the theater, sure. really. He came back afterwards and said, you guys are sitting on a million dollars here. As it turned out we were sitting on even more than a million. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first thing you ever produced. Yeah, it was. He came to the first day of rehearsal as the producer and he said, rehearse six weeks, do everything. This is the last you see me. I'm going to be the kind of producer I always wanted as, as uh -huh. a director. I'm not going to be around. Uh -huh. So he didn't come uh, until we went to Washington that he came. And then he came once a week. Mm -hmm always with interesting uh, insights. Good ideas for cuts, particularly. Yeah. That's, there's, that's one, a, there's a number called Never Fully Dressed Without a Smile, which uh -huh. was bringing down the house in Washington. It was uh -huh. really good. And he said, cut the last 16 bars. We said, what? That number is one of our biggest hits. Well, the, it gets huge applause. He said, try it. Try it without the last 16 bars. The, the applause doubled. He was right. You know? uh -huh. It was, you know. Yeah. Want to leave, them morning, leave the morning more. Yeah, yeah, That's sure, right. absolutely. They're not, they're not all uh, smash. I want to hear about all of them. All right. I'm okay. going to grill you. All right. Like, all right. A, like, a, like a tuna. <laughs> like a bluefin tuna. Whoa, coolness. Look at this. Robin Wagner did it for us. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. Look at that. We've got, oh, my God. Here we are. Oh, wow. We got a New Yorker That's poster a New York, there. New Yorker cover that came out was just thrilling to me because of my attachment with the yeah. New Yorker. I worked there for years, and I just loved the idea that we could make the cover of the New Yorker. Got the Hirschfeld. The, uh, that's the Hirschfeld of Annie. Of Annie. Was he around for Hairspray? Was he? He was. That's over in the corner. There's oh, a, there's a yeah. There's a, it's one of the last ones he did, I think. Yeah. He was. What, 98 when he did that drawing and so Yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. It's, it's pretty amazing. Good. Do you think, when you're writing a show, oh, do you think, okay, I've got to have a character with a need? Yes, I do. I mean, I... And, like, it's like it's like Annie's a killer, one of those. Like, yeah. right off, 
it's like usually the first or second number in a musical, preferably a woman, will take a guy yeah. saying, I need this. We did it. Uh, you know, that, that's what Hairspray is all about. Hairspray is a fabulous yeah. another, I need this, period. Yeah, right. End of discussion, this is what I need. Yeah. All I want is a room somewhere. Boom. Yeah, right. Got it. Get it for it. Yeah, right. You know? And I, I, that's the kind of musical I write. I mean, in Producers, we had two, two I wants. We had mm -hmm. Nathan uh, as Bialystok singing. He used to be the king of Broadway. I will be king again. Mm -hmm. And then Matthew sings the world's simplest I want song called yeah. I Want to Be a Producer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, so that was all on the nose stuff of it. But, but it worked because we, kept, we yeah. cared about the two guys. Yeah. I, I was in London last week uh, and saw Oliver, which I hadn't seen since oh, I was a kid. It's a wonderful musical. It's fabulous. It's great. Yeah. But uh, as an American and as a theater writer, I got very antsy because there's a long time yeah. between Food Glorious Food and then when he finally sings where is love is one number. Oh, yeah. There are three numbers in there. That's right. The, yeah. And you're like, I just found myself. The English audience was like, happy over here. We're amusing characters. But as an American, I was like, who do I love? Why do I love them? What do we got? Right. Uh, Mike Okrant, who was a wonderful guy, who, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was going to, originally was going to direct uh, producers. But one thing he said, to, it, it's the four pillars that you need. You need a good opening number with a Mm -hmm. Creating the character. You need to smash, finish to act one. Yeah. You've got to bring the curtain up in act one, wake him up. Yeah. Act. And then finale. Yeah. The rest is, you know, you fill it. Yeah. But, but it's sort of like that. It's so simplistic, but it is actually true. Cry Baby was another John Waters, and so uh, after Hairspray, it was sort of difficult to, to get people excited about another John Waters. And I think that. There were certain things in Hairspray, like the whole race section, right. which w gave it a, uh, a much more texture and subtext. And sure. And uh, that Crybaby didn't have that. It was kind of like a sequel but it without being a sequel. Right. It felt like it was a sequel. We, we're kind of... trying to keep the same John Borders feeling, you know. Right. That, that kind of eccentric and uh -huh. slightly weird. But even, the, even the movie of Crybaby was never the hit that the movie of, no, of Hairspray no. was. And Hairspray had race in a really fun way. And, exactly, yeah. And it had a fat girl, which is sort of America's last well, that, prejudice we're allowed to have. Exactly. I mean, she, she stood for all the fat girls in America and with her fat family and, and yeah. her fat mother. And, and, these, and it was sort of a celebration of, of outsiders who... Yeah. who uh, End up being the winner. She gets the boy. And they, she gets everything. Yeah, totally. And, and uh, you and can't even stop in, the beat at the uh -huh. end. It's yeah. a terrific score. Yeah. And when I came into it, uh, the, Mark, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman had already written the opening number, which was Good Morning Baltimore. And it's like a book writer's dream because all the exposition of the story mm. is in that number. And uh, so and it, it tells us who she is, uh, where she is in Baltimore. Uh, the time, the period, the sound is the, the, the great early 60s pop sound that they, they had on the, in the score. It was just one thing after another. So that was a, a dream to work on because they were so good. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where the audience was dragging you in a direction that you didn't think you wanted to be going? Uh, the audience is best for telling you where you've gone wrong, I think. But, but the, 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 the big laugh line and nobody laughs. Right. Uh, maybe it isn't funny after all. I think that when, particularly in the early previews of the show, I mm. I stand at the back and I have sort of one eye on the stage, but I'm really just watching the audience and listening to the audience. Have preview audiences uh, changed from Annie to Crybaby? Have they changed? There's. I think the the the, the early preview audiences are pretty loaded with. Uh, yeah. People are out to get you on the internet <laughs> a little bit, you know, feeling Well, they didn't have the internet in Annie. So, like, no, was, was there the a internet. sense of, like, no, the, it, it, one Schubert Alley clerk was ready to rip you to shreds, <laughs> like, to or something? Or? No, I, we, had, we had very welcoming, uh, good audiences for Annie all the way. Except mm -hmm. my Annie was my first show, and up at good speed, when we started doing it, it didn't play that well at the beginning. We, we did so much work on it. We played 14 weeks there, and we worked all the time. 
And I was standing outside when the audience was coming out, and a, a man came up to me and said, do you have anything to do with the show? And I said, yes, I wrote the book. He said, it stinks. <laughs> So Charming. that was my, my first review. Charming. Right. Charming. So my first play, somebody came up to me and said, do you have anything to do this play? And I said, yeah, I happen to be the writer. And she goes, don't do it again. <laughs> well, well, thank That's you. That's the same guy, I think. And I was like, well, he was a drag, if that was the case. <laughs> right. So after Annie, which was this huge hit, then you got into I Remember Mom. I Remember Mom. Which was not... Were you depressed? Were you sad? Were you fine? You went to the, went to the back of the album and said, oh, yeah, I saw the hit. I was uh, depressed, un unhappy. It was a very unhappy trip, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But uh, Steve Sondheim himself has said, you're not really a Broadway writer until you have a flop. So, uh, so I got that in. You got that out of the way. <laughs> and then what was the next project for you? Well, was the it the things I went to California and worked on a bunch of movies. Yeah, that was... And so, did you do that running away from the theater? Or well, was it just presented itself? And... It presented itself. Mal Brooks called me and mm -hmm. wanted me to do a movie for him and his wife, Anne Bancroft. Uh -huh. and we did To Be or Not To Be a remake, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which maybe wasn't such a good idea because the original movie was so mm -hmm. fantastic. But, yeah. uh, but I had fun working on it. And then uh, I just, we finished that and I was headed back to New York and he said, well, I got this other idea. Let's do a parody of Star Wars, uh -huh. Star Wars movies. And so... I ended up doing Spaceballs uh, uh -huh. with them. and uh, Which is a big cult hit. It, yeah, that, oddly enough, it is now. It wasn't a big box office hit, but, yeah. but uh, it was it was fun. We were laughing our heads off all the time. Uh -huh. You went off to do movies, and were you still depressed about theater, or you didn't think about theater? Well, or you no, just, I thought about it, but I... But you distracted. I was distracted, really. Yeah. And, uh, but, but I mean, I over the years, of having started as a magazine writer, and then I did some television, and... Uh, then the movies and uh, mm. the theater is the only one that interests me at all. Right. That, that I really enjoy working in the theater. First of all, a writer is more respected, as, uh -huh. as you know, in Hollywood. Is, I still thought that I could, I was still looking for to get back on Broadway seriously. Right. And then you started on Annie 2 right then? Yeah. And was that, and that kind of, that closed at the Kennedy Center, didn't it? Yes, it did. And then we reworked it in a, a, a Eventually evolved into any war box. Right. How did you, you see, you've had these like unsuccessful shows. How did you like get up and say, like, okay, the producers, I have the, I have the nerve to do this? Well, I was a little gun shy and uh, I, I was a little disappointed now because right, sure. I was looking. But, uh, but because of Melvin, he, he called me on producers. And, uh, right. Which was the greatest sensation of like the decade. I know. It was, it was amazing. David Geffen wanted to do a Broadway musical of the producers, and would I be interested in working with him on it? And that was just like five seconds of thought because I knew the yeah, movie. Yeah, you made say like that's I mean, a no brainer. That's that's it. It seemed like this is really a good idea. When I was a kid and I saw the movie, I th I assumed it had been a play. Oh yeah, right. Because it just felt like a New York well, theater he, story. Well, he wrote it as a play. Couldn't get it produced, and then made the movie. My instincts were. Once yeah, again, correct. You were correct. So that, Infallible. But, now, was he doing the score originally, or...? Uh, originally, uh, David Geffen wanted to get Jerry Herman oh, to do wow. it, and Mel went to Jerry, Jerry Herman, and Jer Jerry Herman, at least as Mel tells the story, said, I know a writer who's written some very good songs, let me play them for you, and he mm. played High Anxiety, and, yeah. and yeah. said, Mel, you could do it, and then so, uh -huh. so Mel set out to write his own score. Uh -huh. Uh, Have we verified that with, with Jerry Herman? <laughs> Jerry Herman! I never said that. I said I would love to write. <laughs> I would love to write the producers. I wouldn't be surprised. Mel <laughs> is well. Not everything he says is actually. He, he has a great imagination. <laughs> <laughs> because I know him well enough to know some of his most famous anecdotes about his life story. Are were co-written by you? <laughs> to be in the room, he seems like such energy oh, it and is. And ideas. And do you just like want to go, stop, well, focus? First of all, he comes in, well, he comes in two hours late, but he comes in. Right. Uh, and he sparks with, with uh, ideas mm -hmm. and uh, lines and things like that. What percentage are good? What percentage bad? His batting average is about 100. <laughs> really? <laughs> One in 10 was. But, you know... He, we got into a relationship uh, where rather than his yes man, I who was his no man. Right. I mean, would say to him, he say, how about this? And I said, mm. Mel Brooks, that's a terrible, you know, that's not funny. It's yeah. not good. 
How about this? Uh-huh. No. Then we'd be sitting like, we're, and the producers and we were writing, we made up the Siegfried Oath that they had to, uh-huh. had to take in order for the Bialystok and Bloom in order uh-huh. to get the rights to this play, uh-huh. play Springtime for Hitler, had to take the Siegfried Oath. Uh-huh. And we're, we're writing, I wrote the Siegfried Oath, uh-huh. that part, and, and then I said, yeah, let's see. Uh, when, you know, we swear allegiance to Adolf Hitler and so forth. And so uh-huh. Nelson, I get, how about this? We swear, swear allegiance to Adolf Elizabeth Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> we said, not many people know it, but the fear was descended from a long line of English queens. <laughs> so suddenly, what was sort of funny would burst into, uh-huh. I, I fell on the floor when he said Adolf uh-huh. Elizabeth Hitler. <laughs> That's the kind of thing Mel could yeah. out of nowhere. I said, and it's, there's no question that. Uh, the people I've worked with, he's an authentic genius, a comic genius. Yeah, he's crazy. He's, he's, he's amazing. He's, he's amazing. It's amazing. He's a fountain of comedy. But on YouTube, I've been watching a lot of him on talk shows from oh, the fifties yeah. and sixties, and oh, you just go, wow. wow, like the just the rhythm and the and the yeah. the way he speaks. And oh, just... he, he always talks about his whole rhythm comedy. He he had been a drummer when he was a kid. And it's so Huge. much. He does know that. When you're writing a scene, how much how important is rhythm for a lot? Uh, for certainly comedy. And, and I think musicals, they the, the singing has stopped and the drum, the percussionist has stopped, but they've got the drive going. You've got to keep it going. But and I, find I, I, get, keep... I get very scared in, in a musical where the band stops and that this is it. Right. <laughs> Let's get quickly to that next yeah. number. But how many, is it like a couple. rule of how many pay, how much time? Or I don't like to go more than about three pages. Young Frankenstein was quickly, no, Hairspray was Hairspray next. Hairspray was next. Which yeah. was also... It was a big hit. Enough time had passed so that I could have these rules, and they not, they can be broken, but right. but the, the whole idea that we talk about, that when you look at something you want to make a musical, is there a big, sensual character who's bigger than life, who has something he or she desperately wants? That, right. That's the start, and then the, the musical can be that, that the journey of that person, the, the striving and the quest to, to get where they want to go. And uh, in the musical that I do, they get it at the end. Uh-huh. They, they succeed. Uh-huh. I mean, Tracy Turnbaud gets uh-huh. gets the guy, and she gets she gets a scholarship to junior college. Yeah. <laughs> so when Young Frankenstein was was right after Hairspray, or was it yeah. the works yeah, before? It was, yeah, but Young Frankenstein had a long gestation period too, mm-hmm. because it was hard to get Mel's attention to get back. But he, but he wanted to do Young Frankenstein. Right. I thought the Young Frankenstein was a less natural musical right. than uh, producers. The producers of the world of the theater. Yeah, exactly. That it sings to you. I, I think another thing you've got to think about when you're doing musical is where does it sing? Does it sing? Does it reach moments that are of emotion that that calls for music? So it didn't, and it it didn't follow all of our rules for writing musicals. Mm-hmm. My I always say at the start of any project, uh, I understand this is called a musical. <laughs> right. It's not about, the, the book has got to be good. The book right. has got to serve it, but right. it's the music that's going to make it or break it. Well, I, I think Peter Stone said it best, is that he said that a, a, a musical with a mediocre score and a great book is a hit. Yeah. A musical with a fabulous score and a bad book is dead. But anyone can whistle is a good example of, of, of Sondheim writing a really yeah. interesting score. And it was the first time he wrote music yeah. and lyrics. Mm-hmm. And Arthur Lawrence writing the book, so you think it's going to be great. And it was just way off. The book, the do you book ever, work at all. Do you ever wish you could travel back in time or you go out of town and see a friend's show and just like, oh, give me, just give me three days with this? Well, once in a while I, I could see uh, shows that come in. And I said, I wish I'd been done. With them and out there, I could have I could have yeah. told them some things. Are there writers of books that you absolutely love and admire and pour over or interested in? Uh, I think that uh, you Wheeler, the two books he wrote for yeah. Sondheim are uh, a little night music, which is with yeah. some help from Ingmar Bergman, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a terrific book. I just saw this revival the other night. I was so impressed by it. the score; is so beautiful. And then uh, my favorite musical, really. Uh, just about of all time at Sweeney Todd, and that's the Wheeler book. And the, I think that with all his genius, some of the Sondheim shows suffer from bad books. I mean, yeah. Follies is not really a good book. Yeah. And Company is not a book at all, in a sense. But, Little vignettes also. Yes, but, but uh, or not the kind of 
thing I think about Sweeney Todd. Yeah. There, is, there is a real strong, fabulous story and uh -huh. characters. It's got it all. And then top it with a score like that. It's, yeah. it's a model. But even though it doesn't, it breaks my rule of happy endings, <laughs> to say the least. But Arthur Lawrence uh, for Gypsy is, a, is another model book. Just terrific, yeah. you know, every, all the way through. The story is so well told, the characters are so strong. Mama Rose is like a giant character. And mm. What she wants is a success for her children. You really know, you know what she's after. Boy, she's she's yeah. really after it from the moment the curtain goes up. Sing out Louise. You know? Yeah. It's, and that whole show, it's a, and then that score, Sondheim. Yeah, Julie Stein. Julie yeah. Stein, my gosh. Can't beat it. Yeah, they're, th those are the models for me, those shows like that. Well, they're good, <laughs> they're only the best. Right, right yeah. Um, I'm just gonna take uh, five minutes now and be completely envious. How do you deal with repulsive success? <laughs> Complete overwhelming. Well, it's stunning, really. Uh, you, you, you're thrown off balance with everything. And I, and a lot of friends later said, you know, after Annie, you've changed. And I thought, I haven't really. I feel like I'm the same person and, and I've never changed. And then I realized that what had changed was their perception of me. They were looking at me with different eyes. That yeah. I'd had that happen to me and was still standing. Well, yeah. But it was, it was, the nicest part was like suddenly making some money, which I hadn't had any. <laughs> At the point of any opening, I had really zero bank account and a uh, lot Did you come from a, a wealthy background? I came from a uh, modest, uh, I think what we would call lower middle class. Mm -hmm. My father died when I was a kid. My mother supported four children by being a nurse at a hospital. Wow. And uh, I was the oldest of the four. And uh, we sort of struggled along. Uh -huh. uh, but I loved uh, the theater right away, and I was sort of like a, I remember that in the eighth grade, I put together a group of George M. Cohen's songs and put on a show for the eighth grade. And it was like, I re later realized that's the first book I ever wrote. And, they, and it was a jukebox musical. It was a jukebox musical. <laughs> Would you do one? Would you, if somebody said, I've got the music of the Bee Gees, I've got the no, music. I, I, I've actually had a couple of those uh, that I've said no to. I, I don't really want to do them. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I think that the guys did a great job on Jersey Boys. I was amazed. I, yeah. didn't, I couldn't have done that. I just, right. uh -huh. I, it's not my kind of thing. I, I love original scores. And right, sure. Maybe, I don't, so that's why I don't, wouldn't want to write, rewrite an old musical. I guess. For Xanadu, I met the composer, one composer on opening night. Oh, really? And the other composer I never, I've still not met. I love working with composers. There, there's one thing. I, I, it's a mystery writing music. I couldn't write a note of music. I mean, I so admire it. It's like what a talent to so be able to write. Like Charles Strauss is the piano. Oh, no, it's great. I think the book writer is always like the low man that told him pole in the, in the whole deal. Anyway, but and I, how do you feel I, about I, that? Does that? Are you fine with that? Are you making peace with it? No, I, I sort of like it. You know. All these years, uh, there's no, in no way do I feel I'm famous. I'm not famous. Mm -hmm. The things I wrote are famous. Right. But I can walk the streets and the, no yeah. crowd stop ever. You know? Yeah. But I can be, you know, I love standing at the back of the theater with one of my shows. Yeah. Nobody, as they come out, nobody knows I had anything to do with it. Yeah. And if it was fun and if it was like this kind of great orgasmic feeling you have at the end of, mm -hmm. say, Hairspray, where they're all saying, yeah. you can't stop the beat. I just stand there smiling and say, well, gee, I did something here. Yeah. <laughs> they had a good time. Yeah. And then, you know, it's it's a nice way to make it some money, but it, ultimately it's not, it's not really about the money. It's, it, I mean, of course, it's always about the money to a degree, but it's, but it's, it's the fun of doing it. The, 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 I just could, couldn't presumably retire, but all I want to do is more shows. Yeah. I, I like being out of town. I know it's supposed to be hell, but I, I always enjoy the bar late at night. And <laughs> I do too. The camaraderie like, and the it's, well, I never went to college. I always think that's what college must be like. You just sit up all night having BS sessions. But yeah, what right. you're doing is trying to save, like, how do we keep this character who has absolutely no action? The actor is cold backstage oh, for right. three scenes. How do you keep him alive? Oh, right, yeah. You got to come up with something. And I love that. It's like well, a little I challenge. Yeah, well, I, I think. Uh, 
it's all pu puzzle solving, I think. And I'd love to do puzzles. I'd like to do very complicated British crossword puzzles and things like that. Really? Oh, I can't uh, stand that stuff. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 it's like, like maybe my books are suffering. That's what I need to do. I'm, you and Sondheim with the crossword puzzles. Oh, yeah, he's, 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 he's big at it, yeah. I do mind games, but I'm, yep. that's the same thing. <laughs> right. With people I work with, right. I play with their heads mind a little games, bit. Right. But I, I do think, I look at it, putting the book together as like a big puzzle, like oh, yeah. Jigsaw or something. And oh. that piece has got to oh. fit here somewhere, you know, that sort of thing. Because uh, there, it's, I, I can change metaphors in a second, but, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like a big tapestry and everything has to be sewn exactly right or uh -huh. else it doesn't work. Yeah. And figuring it all out is uh, and that, and then when it, when you get it and say, oh hey, this really is okay, and then the previews, that's when I really get yeah. excited and interesting, and because then it's like sometimes it's it's like taking bandages off your eyes. You suddenly see the, uh -huh. the shows in a whole different way. Do you have more than one project? Like right now, if I said, how many projects? What's on your desk right now? I have about four or five things that are. Very and is it always four or five things, and you're hoping one will go, or...? Yeah. Uh, Josh Logan said you always have to have five things going at once to get one on. Uh, and he but, was in a much more productive time, so, yes, that's so we have to have ten. We have to have <laughs> ten. No, you, I think it... The, the fact is, I... I enjoy working on several at once, too. Right. I, you know, I can... One day, just say, all right, today is Dave, and uh -huh. tomorrow is... Tootsie and whatever. I do like the process. I like to write. Oh. And, uh, otherwise, why, you know? If you weren't a writer, do you, what would you, what do you think you'd like to be? Somehow, as a kid, uh, get it in my mind that I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. By the age of 9, 10, 11, mm -hmm. I thought I wanted to be a writer. Mainly, the thing was I got into reading, and I was just like one of these kids who just started reading mm -hmm. day and night and reading everything I saw. Loved reading, and thought maybe I could be a writer. Uh -huh. But my mother, be, having been a nurse, wanted me to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I always said, well, yes, I'll, I'm going to be a doctor. I'll go to medical school. Mm -hmm. But I knew deep down, but I didn't tell anybody I wanted to be a writer because it seemed like mm -hmm. some kind of sissified thing. That, right. you know, I wanted to be one of the football players. Uh -huh. uh, when you have difficulty writing something, do you just go for a walk? Do you sleep on it? Do you have yeah. a drink? Do you call friends? I go watch a baseball game or something. Baseball? Like that. Really? Things like that. Just like it'll come to you later. Yeah, let, just st not think about it for a while. And uh, it's often true that you're stuck, you're stuck, and then the next day, you oh, right. What's a good lead? What do you think a good lead into a song? What's a bad well, lead into a song? It's very important in the lead into the song is, is not to tip what the song's about. Yes. The song has to come out of the, where the character is emotionally at that moment. If the, if, so it could be extreme anger can lead somebody to burst right. into song, but you, you don't want to... The cardinal sin is that for a book writer is to say what the song says. Right. You have to let the song be the surprise, and the song has to, to, make, to enlarge it upon the thought and what's going on, particularly also any kind of love song. Mm -hmm. But I, it's it's simple enough to lead it. If you if you built the s scene correctly in terms of the emotions of the scene, mm -hmm. if a young girl like Tracy's in love, mm -hmm. and she sings, I I can hear the bells. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't say, Gee, Tracy, can you hear any bells? <laughs> yeah, you want the song to come organically out of it, but also to have sort of a left field take. Exactly. Like, why are we here? Oh, I get it. Yeah, right. Because you're like, oh, they're here. Like, oh, I get it now. Yeah, it all right, comes exactly. together in a fun way. So what was the real lead-in for I Can Hear the Bells? Do you remember? Tracy arrives at this uh, audition at the station for people to be on the teenage show, and she sees the, the, the heartthrob right. boy who's there. And uh, he sort of walks by her mm -hmm. and brushes against her by mistake and says, oh, sorry, little darling. She just turns, swivels, looks at him and says, and starts singing like right. the bells. Uh -huh. Have you ever taken anything from your personal life and put it in your real life and put it into your work? Not really. I mean, but mm. for instance, Annie's birthday is October 28th. That's my daughter's birthday. Okay. My daughter, Kate. Most of the orphans are named after cousins and nieces. <laughs> um, and then a friend of mine, said after running for a while, he said, you know who Annie is? And he said, 
And I said, no, he says, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her, your father again, your lost father. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. It's, but I don't know about that. Look at that, at the le final seconds of the interview, look what you come out with. <laughs> right. Thomas. Hey, thank you for coming here. Thank you for giving me, to me all that I need to know to become incredibly wealthy and have a townhouse in Greenwich Village. Oh, um, well. You know, we're doing all right. I no, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. But I'm going to go write well, a big hit now and do all the, all you know, right. all the rules. You said four pillars. <laughs> Need, go, gotcha. All right. And get a really get a living composer. Okay. I'm good. All right, all right. Thank We're you. We're on our way. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. It's great to meet you.